You know, we're talking about preparations. And the sermon today will be on preparations. And what is Roman Chapel doing but preparing our children that they may learn what the gospel is? Sometimes we get prepared, but we stay prepared in one place. We're not out in the world. And how important is it that we reach the children? How important is it that we reach out and touch those that are in need? Our children are in need. There's a, most people may not know this. Do you know, if only a child is brought to Christ, their chances of bringing in their parents into the church is only three to five percent chances of their parents ever reaching Christ. But is it worth it for three to five percent of those parents to know Jesus Christ through the child? Absolutely. On the same statistics, it says that if a, if a mother accepts Christ and comes to the church, there's about 75 percent chance that that family will come into the church. Is that worth it? Yes, it is. And also in preparation, if a man accepts Jesus Christ, do you know what the percentage of that family, that the man that accepts Christ comes to church? 95% of the families will come to church if the man is brought in. But now let's bring it down to the children. In preparation, how do we prepare these children? Do you know, I said it for many times, our churches in America, we lost a generation because we didn't want the hippies in the church. We didn't want the long haired, blue jean wearing hippies to come into our churches. Our churches were pristine. Our sanctuaries were clean. Everything was quiet. We rejected that whole group of people. And guess who's running our country now? Those that we rejected. Look at these children that go to the Rome Chapel. Those that worked in Awana. There's a couple of kids that came to Awana that came out of the Rome Chapel. I was amazed at how much scripture she knew. And she had memorized. And I said, then I go, are you, where do you get this from? And what her mark was? Rome Chapel. You see, and she is still active today. She's now in high school. She's active in her church. And she's very active in reaching life. And she actually comes and helps the Awana program now. So why? Because somebody took the time to prepare the way. Jesus needed a man to prepare the way. Anybody know who that was? John the Baptist. John the Baptist. He needed the time to prepare the way. We all need somebody. But you see, most of people prepare the ways for the wrong things and the wrong reasons. How many of you ever heard of the pyramids? of Egypt, the Grand Pyramid. Well, what do you think those were built for? There were tombs. The, the Pharaoh Khufu built the Grand Pyramid so that he would have preparations for what? For the afterlife. The pagans, they were pagans, but they knew there was something more to life than just this existence. They were pagans, they may not even have the education we have today, and they did not graduate from Purdue University or Notre Dame or IU, but guess what? They knew there was a God. They knew there was something beyond this existence that we have today. And so, in their pagan minds, they prepared a something for the next generation, for the next event in their lives. Sadly to say, they were pagans. Sad to say they didn't know this man named Jesus, and they did not have the proper preparations. Many of us prepare things wrongfully. We as Christians have things are prepared. We have our estates ready for us. We have wills. We have living wills. We have all of these things. We're prepared in case we die so we can take care of our families. But my question for you today is, are you preparing your family for the great event that's going to happen one day when the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords come, into the, and come in the heavens and the trumpet is blown. <coughs> are we going to be properly prepared for that day? How many of you are prepared to meet heaven? If I ask you a question, 
He showed up to heaven. And St. Peter asked you, why should I let you into my heaven? What would be your answer? Jesus Christ is my Savior. Jesus Christ is my Savior. It's the only answer you can have. You can say, well, I went to Rolling Chapel. Sorry. I went to Sunday school. Sorry. I was a deacon in a church. Sorry. I was an elder. That got to get me into heaven, right? Eh. Nope. The answer is very simple. If you did not properly prepare yourself with Jesus Christ, you will not get into heaven. And only through Jesus Christ will you get into heaven. In Malachi and in Isaiah, John the Baptist prepared the way for Jehovah. God says, I, he will clear the way for me. You see, we need a, prepare, a preparation on how we can be prepared to go to heaven. And I'm sorry, it is not just coming to church. It is not just sitting here listening to a preacher. It is not just singing songs on Christmas Eve. Those are shadows of the real thing. If you do not have a relationship with Jesus, you are not preparing the way for the Lord. Let us pray. Oh, Heavenly Father, we thank you, we praise you. Touch us, Lord, that we may prepare our hearts for you, Lord, as we prepare for Christmas, as we prepare for this great holiday. Let us, Lord, prepare our hearts for you and you alone. We thank you and we praise you. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. You know, we all have treasures. How many of you guys have treasures? How many of you don't, how many of you don't think you have any treasures at all? So everyone here has a treasure, right? right? What is your most, what is the greatest treasure you have? Anybody? My Bible. Your Bible? That's a great treasure. What else? <laughs> Grandchildren? Kids. What else? Kids? Yourself? <laughs> yeah, Jesus Christ definitely. But see, we all have treasure. The Egyptians, okay, when they fared, when they died, what did they do? They put all of their treasures in the tomb with them because they wanted to do what? They wanted to take it with them. You know, we're not going to take our treasures with us. But yet, do you know what an idol is? An idol is anything that's between you and God. And do you know how I can test you if something is an idol or not? Ask somebody from Triumph. <laughs> Let me touch your treasure, see how angry you get. Let me touch that thing that becomes an idol when you get angry if somebody else touches your idol. It may be a fishing rod. It may be a deer stand. Maybe a pickup truck. Car. A, it can be a car. Okay? It can be it can be your children. Never. But you see, when the Egyptians they try to hide, they try to bring all of their stuff with them. They even buried it with them. And what happened when they died? Thieves came and what? So look at all these, look at all these grave sites that we find they find in Egypt. They most of just about every one of them have been what? Been robbed. Been stolen. Somebody else enjoyed it. You know, there was a person in North Carolina that was the him and his wife, they were stingy as they could be. They were making money, but they didn't want to spend it on anything. Nothing at all. It was whatever you gotta hoard it. You gotta hoard it. They had money. They hoarded it. They hoarded it. This lady wouldn't even buy clothes because she didn't want to waste the money. She got the car accident and died. The husband married another woman, and the other woman enjoyed every cent that she saved. <laughs> she had a blast with it. Mercedes Benzes, Rolex watches.
$400 shoes. Okay? But you know, we try to preserve these things, and many times, it, it, for nothing. The Bible teaches us differently. <clears throat> the truth is, man cannot hold on to anything that's temporary. In Matthew 21, But listen, 
275 verses. But that's okay. You need a new version. You see, you're not investing your treasure into what it is. If you don't understand it, I remember my dad. I said, Dad, what does this mean? Do you know what his answer was? Do you know what a dictionary is, son? <laughs> Look it up. What was he doing? Was he being mean? He was teaching. You see, he was investing. We need to build wisely. First Corinthians 3.10. It's on page 1753 of the Pew Bible. Let's go to verse 9. For we are God's fellow workers. You are God's field. You are God's building. According to the grace of God, which was given to me as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation and another builds on it. But let each one take heed how he builds on it. For no other foundation can anyone lay then which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ tells us that he is the foundation. He's the cornerstone. The foundation was laid by who? The prophets and the apostles. And he's the cornerstone. The Bible is the foundation of our faith. We don't need any more foundations being built. Have you ever built any building at all? Can you imagine if we're going to build a new church building and we start laying the foundation and Jim Clary comes up and says, well, you know what? I don't like the wall there. I want it over here. So he tells the, the construction people to change the foundation to start putting the wall over here. Then Mike Iron comes up and says, you know what? I don't like it over here. Let's put a wall over here. You know, and then we get another elder come up and he goes, no, I don't like that. Becky says, you know what, I like it over here because it's going into the garden. So that's the foundation that we're going to be building. What building would we get? A messed up one. Why? Because, see, the church cannot be built on our foundation. It cannot be built on what we want. It cannot be built on things that we think it should be done. The foundation of the church of Jesus Christ has to be built on the word of God, pure and simple. This is the truth. This is the way. There's no other way into heaven except what the Bible tells us to do. Now, we can start building on top of that foundation. We can start building different things, and then we can actually have a sanctuary that looks great with pink and purple polka dot carpet. <laughs> Wouldn't that be great? Come on, you guys don't think a pink and purple polka dot uh, carpet would look great in the sanctuary? Why not? If this earthly stuff doesn't matter, what does it matter what color the carpet is? You see, we're looking at things on this earth that doesn't matter. In reality, it doesn't care. I don't care if the carpet is pink and purple polka dots if we're reaching the loss for Jesus Christ. I don't care if the building is made out of brick or made out of sawdust if we're reaching the loss for Jesus Christ. So what is the foundation that we need to work on? What is the preparation that we need to have? We need organizations like the Roman Chapel. We need organizations like the Gideons. We need organizations like the church that is putting that foundation of Jesus Christ so that people can be built on top of it and that we can have this great banquet in heaven one day. What's this banquet going to be if we don't have these people coming? You may be surprised one day when you get to heaven. You may find people that you don't like there. <laughs> you may find that woman that's been get, 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 all your life sitting there. Because you see, we don't decide who gets to heaven. We're not the judges. We're not the doorkeepers. We're not the ones that determine who gets into heaven or not. All we are is God's hands and his feet.
while we're here on earth to do His will and to accomplish what He wants us to accomplish. The pyramids boasted of the power of the pharaohs. Look how great I am. And there's many of us today that boast in that power. We build our own pyramids. We build our businesses. We build our ministries around that. We think that, look, how great this ministry is. Five, six, ten thousand people are coming to this ministry. Oh, they must be really blessed. And trust me, I've talked to some of these pastors that do pastor these big ministries. Do you know what they always tell me? How big the ministry is. Talk to any one of them. They will tell you how big the ministry is. What is wrong with that? If that's their idol, that's the problem. Because you see, how big was the, how big was the ministry of Jesus Christ? He had 12 people. One betrayed him, the rest left. So in the eyes of this world, Jesus would be considered a what? Failure. A failure. Why? Because see, Jesus was not building an empire here on earth. He was building an empire in heaven and he was preparing so that when he died that people would come to him and know that he is the only way, the truth, and the life. No one can come unto the Father except by him. How foolish these builders were. Today, look at all these, look at the pharaohs. They're all gone. I think they found what? One tomb? That was not robbed. Anybody know what tomb that was? Tutankhamun. Tutankhamun. Yeah, the little kid. One. Out of all these things, all been robbed. How many of you got invested in the stock market? That's a sure thing, right? No. <laughs> but see, when you invest time in the children and put time into them that they learn the gospel of Jesus Christ, now you're storing up treasures in heaven. When you build, what type of materials do we look for? We go try, when we build, we go find the Worst piece of wood there is, right? No. We go try to find the best materials that we can find. You know, and so when we're building lives, and we're building into the lives of these of these children, building the lives of people around us, <coughs> we need to not to use this cheap stuff. All right? Just because it's easier to read, don't necessarily mean it's right. Just because you Googled it doesn't mean that's the answer. You have to do the research. I told a young man one day, I already had the answer, but I said, look, I'm preparing the sermon. I want you to do some research for me. Five minutes later, he came back with a sheet of paper and says, here it is. And I said, what is this? Well, that's your research. I said, no, you just Googled it and printed it. You didn't do the research. Who, who wrote this article? Well, I don't know. Does the man that wrote these answers, where is his faith? What does he stand on? Where is his theology? Does he believe that the Bible is the word of God? Or does he believe that it's a story? You've got to do the work and the hard work behind it. It costs. It is not cheap. A lot of people today, they want to go hear just messages that are tweaking of the ears. <coughs> The feel-good message. Well, look, Jesus warned us about that. He says in the end times, there's going to be people that's all they're going to want to hear is the good, soft message. But you see, when you do that, you're not preparing the person to receive what's really going to happen to them. You give them the soft gospel. You teach them that, you know what? Don't worry about it. You can live any way you want to. As long as you were baptized in water, you're going to go to heaven. Is that what the Bible teaches? No. How do we prepare wisely? How do we take it to the next level? 
Well, we need to accept Jesus Christ as our Savior. Look at Revelation 14. Then I heard a voice from the heavens saying to me, Right, blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from when? Now on. Blessed are those that what? Are in the Lord. You cannot be prepared. We're losing our children in our colleges because we have not prepared them for the questions that these, these professors are throwing at them. We're not preparing them to defend the gospel of Jesus Christ. We're not preparing them to be able to stand up and see scrutiny. Pastors are no longer even using the Bible to tell the people, look, read the word of God. We don't want to put it on the screen. They want people just trust me. I'm going to tell you something. You are a fool if you just trust a pastor that says trust me. Amen. You better check them out. You do the research. Study the word of God. And if he's wrong, tell him. You know, years ago, somebody came to me and said, Pastor, you did this wrong. I said, okay, show it to me. And he showed it to me and I said, okay, where did I get it wrong at? And we started reading through it. And later on he says, oh, you did have it right. I said, of course I had it right. I read the word of God. Where did you get that that I was wrong? You know what her answer was? I heard it from a pastor. Read the Word of God. Very important that you read the Word of God. Why is reading the Word of God so important? Look at Hebrews 9, 28. A man dies what? One time. You don't have a second chance here. Get your theology correct. But get what matters correct. Now, all of you men that have a tie on, you've got a direct line to heaven. You don't got to worry about nothing else no more. So how many of us going to go to heaven? Two of us? Man, you guys got a lot of work to do. Three of us. Oh, I see. All right. <laughs> now, is that biblical? No. no. Of course not. Of course not. You see, sometimes we allow tradition to dictate what is Bible. You know, I said this before. I see how well you guys know Bible. I want you to fill in these verses for me. For God so loved the world that he gave his only God. son, that whosoever believes in him shall not perish ever in life. That's the easy one, right? I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes unto the Father, Father except by me. Right? Yeah. That was an easy one. When it rains, it pours. That's not Bible. <laughs> <laughs> Prepared. <coughs> Application, real quick. How to gather treasures in heaven? How does this application work? How does it work for you and I? <clears throat> we need to use our earthly resources for the kingdom. We need to work hard and use our resources to help the kingdom of God. How many of you believe that when we went down to Peru, South America, that it was a free trip? How many believe that that building was free down there? It costs. But how we use our money is important. Matthew 19 confirms the assumption, and he said, <clears throat> what did Matthew 19, 21 talks about? Remember when he sat there and he says, sell everything you have into the kingdom. Remember the rich man? 
What was wrong with that? Why, why did Jesus tell him that, by the way? Anybody know? Because it was in his heart. Jesus didn't really care if he had riches, because, but his riches became more important to him than the kingdom of God. We here in America, when my brother had a church up there in South Bend, he, it was a big church, it was a rich church. He says, I could get money out of that church. I just couldn't get time. People say, hey, we're going to go do this. He said, people would walk in and says, I'll write a check and pay for it. Billy said, no, I need the bodies to help distribute the, this stuff. We'll pay someone to do it. In, uh, in other cases, in, in Hagerstown, we had a lady, she was a multi-millionaire, a multi-millionaire, okay? And I remember her giving a hundred dollars to a mission trip. And when she handed it, it's one of these like, here, 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 here's a hundred dollars. Grab it, grab it. Remember, it's going to be useful good now. Did not want to let go of it. <laughs> but what does that take us? See, we got to be conscious and we got to prepare what Jesus wants for us. Prepare to leave this earth. Philippians 1 2. How much stuff are you going to leave here? Everything. Everything. How to build wisely. Well, here's the thing build on the right foundation. Don't build on the money and fame and power. Don't think that your fame is going to do anything for you. If I brought in a famous person in here to speak on Sunday morning, if Franklin Graham called me up and said, Jim, I want to preach at your church on Sunday morning, okay. how many people would be in these pews? We'd have to turn them away. Why? Because we're chasing after famous people. Can you imagine? I tried to get him and he, he turned me down. Mike Huckabee would come and speak. And he said, I can't make it. And I said, well, Mike, the only reason you don't want to come is because we're not a Baptist church. And he said, no, Jim, I just can't make it. So I tried to make all kinds of excuses to get him to come. Then he asked, he said, why do you want me to come? And I told him, I said, because if I get you in this church, I'd fill these pews. I know. But see, that's not all bad. Because I do believe in hearing and hearing to the Word of God. And if you get people in here that they can hear the Word of God, using the right material. Let's say, real quick, let's talk some costly materials that cost us a lot to build the kingdom of God. Anybody have any idea what those costly materials would be? The anointing. Why is the anointing a costly material? Because Christ paid for it. Jesus Christ had to die on that cross for us to get that anointing. What about grace? Without grace, we can't go anywhere. What about our attitude? Ask you to do something, but do it with the right attitude. Ian, I'll help you. I'll help you lead worship. Okay. What's that song you want? What's that? What's that song? Come on, let's go. What's that attitude? Bad, bad, bad attitude. You don't like it. <laughs> <laughs> We have to have the right attitude. We cannot be angry all the time. Service. <laughs> it takes time. We're going to build this new cafe out here. It's taking time. It takes service. Once we get it done, it's going to take more service. Somebody's got to prepare the coffee. Someone's going to have to get stuff set up. 
There's going to be service that's going to be required. Here's one that nobody wants to do. You don't want to submit to nobody's authority. We all have to submit to authority. Church authority, godly authority, children need to submit to their parents. We need to submit to authority. And there's authority in every aspect of our lives. If you work somebody, you have a boss. If you're driving down the street and the police officer pulls you over, you have to submit to that authority. But to build the kingdom of God, you have to be under the right authority. And the right authority is the Holy Spirit. And the right authority only comes from the Word of God. There's nothing that you should be doing that's not from the Word of God. There's a lawful authority and unlawful authority. There's a lot of spiritual abuse in life, in churches. There's a Baptist church that people came talk to me about. It. And I says, why are you leaving that church? He says, because the pastor got mad at me because I didn't ask permission to go buy a truck. And I said, where do you get that? He says, spiritual authority. I said, no, run from that church. That's, not, that's spiritual abuse, not proper authority. Ethics. All of these things we need to prepare the way for everything that we do. If we want to build this church, we need that anointing. We need the grace. We need to have the attitude of acceptance. Now, how many of you guys think right here, all of us in here, how many of you think that we would always agree? Matter of fact, let's talk to you real quick. What's the best football team in college? None. None. Notre Dame. Huh? Wesleyan. We can't agree on a football team. So what can we agree on? We can agree on the book and the word of God. There's going to be things that we disagree with. And there's going to be times when we need the maturity to accept things that we don't get our way. You know, I've been married for 34 years. It would be nice to get my way once in a while. <laughs> Yeah, there's a pickup truck said you did. Yep. <laughs> I can't understand why she don't let me buy my 1972 Corvette. That's important. Isn't it? You guys don't care. I do. What I'm trying to say, see how different we are? But we can still come together with a good attitude. We can still come together with service. We can still come together with the love of Christ. We don't all have to agree. We don't all have to like everything that everybody is doing. Okay? We're putting in the lights in that in coffee pot, coffee place over there. Ron said we're going to do it this way. I said we're going to do it this way. We disagree. I was right, he was wrong, and we did it the wrong way. <laughs> but what I'm trying to get it, guys, but, but I'm joking about it, okay? But there was no reason for us to get into a fight over it. Does that make sense? It'll work, okay? Mine would have worked better, but it'll work. <laughs> you know? We need to mature ourselves. And so as we build the parallel way for the Lord, we need, we need that grace, that love, that anointing. And it may be costly. It may become costly to us. We may have to put away this big thing that we have is called pride. We may have to step down and allow something else to happen. It may not be our way every time. But I'm going to tell you, I don't want it my way. I want it Jesus' way. 
Because when I get to heaven, I don't want Jim Moth getting in the way of me getting into heaven. When I get to heaven and I, I, I see Jesus and I hear this good, good and faithful servant enter into the presence of your Lord, that's what I want to do. <coughs> Let us pray. Oh, Heavenly Father, you are an awesome and mighty God. We thank you. We praise you. We worship you. Lord, do, do help us, Lord, in preparing our children, in preparing our church, and preparing people around us for the kingdom of God. We thank you and we praise you. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray.